part of this, and the good news just continues on for today, because we're coming into part two of hope. Hope is, I believe, one of the most underrated gifts that God gives us. Too many people discount the power of hope, the inspiration that hope brings. And it's often easy for us when tough times come to fix our eyes on the circumstances, to get glued to what's happening around us instead of on the answer for us in it. And right now we have an opportunity to learn something today. God has given me a very specific revelation. I've never preached it before that I believe is going to help you understand in a deep way but very simple manner how hope actually works and what you can do with the hope that God has given to you and see it reciprocate over and over again in and through your life. You all ready for that? So the antithesis or the arch enemy of hope is despair. And despair has like a, a lot of ugly cousins. Misery, agony, gloom, disheartened, heaviness, right? All these ugly cousins, these are the synonyms of the word despair. And despair, the enemy uses in a great way to be able to get us off of our game and get us off of our focus of what God is willing to do even in the middle of our mess. I love what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. He says, brothers and sisters, don't think that something strange is happening only to you when trouble comes your way. It's happening to others as well. But the enemy's really good at helping us really get self-centered in those moments and feel like, oh, why me? Oh, woe is me. The truth is all of us are going through something. We live in a broken world and a broken system, and we're all going to experience heartache. We're all going to experience trials and tribulations. Sometimes those tough times are from our own doing. Sometimes they are truly. We are innocent, and they are just from someone else's doing that happens to affect us. And then there are other times it's just pure evil that is attacking us, trying to steal what God has done in your life. And that's the, that's the trick that the devil does really good. You know, Jesus said it in John 10, 10, the thief, Satan, he only comes, the only reason why he comes is to do these three things, steal, kill, and destroy. And sometimes we, we go through that battle, that spiritual warfare, that, that tough time, and on the other end of it, we're just like, oh, we're just at least thankful that we're still here. And yeah, that is good to be thankful that you're at least still here. But maybe something was stolen that you don't realize was stolen. Maybe something was killed or destroyed. Maybe a little hope, maybe a little joy, maybe a little love was taken from you that the devil has no right to take. Because the good news is, at the finish of John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, but... I have come to give you life and life abundantly, life overflowing. So what I want to teach you today is what the Holy Spirit taught me, and it's really based out of a law that comes out of a biblical principle. It's called the law of redemption. And the law of redemption works like this. If I invest something into you, and you choose to take that investment and reinvest it back into me. Then the law of redemption is going to kick in, and you are about to become more blessed from the return of the reinvestment than you were blessed on the original investment. In the business world, it works like this. In the finance world, if you have an investment into a company, you hold shares or something in the company, and, and you've earned dividends on them, and, and now you have a chance to cash some of those dividends out, and instead you choose, I believe in this company, this company is a good source, it has good revenue, and instead of me receiving the dividends, I want to use those dividends, and I want to reinvest into more shares because I believe in this company. But with God, it's even better. 
And that's what I want to show you today. That it's even better. So the message title today is Hope Redeemed. Because the scripture teaches us that whatever the thief has stolen from us, when he is caught, and he will be caught, he will be made to pay back seven times that which was stolen. So you should prepare yourself today to get ready to receive seven times the joy that was stolen, seven times the hope that was stolen, seven times, seven times the love and compassion that was stolen, seven times the time, the energy that was stolen from you. And I want to show you how to do it. You ready? So we're going to jump in. And to get that, we have to understand in the law of redemption, you must know the source of the original investment. And you have to decide, is that source of the original investment into me, is it worthy of me reinvesting that investment back in to the source? And this is where it gets so wonderful. Number one is hope's root or hope's source. Romans 15 verse 13, I pray that God, the what? God. He is the source of hope. He is the originator of hope. He is the giver of hope. He is the essence of hope. I pray that God, the source of hope. See, sometimes we're looking for hope in all the wrong places. We're looking for hope in somebody bailing us out of a situation. We're looking for hope in our friend having the right wise answer. We're, we're looking for hope and we're just going to grit through it and we hope that we make it through it. But the truth is, none of those are the source. And when we go to something that's not the source, how can we expect to gain the investment that was originally made? So we have to go to the source and the source for hope is God and God alone. And now look at the promise here. Anytime we see will, just understand that is a promise from God. So I pray that God, the source of hope, he will fill you completely with joy and peace. Why would he do such a thing? Because you, this is your part, you trust in him. And once you trust in him, then you will, guaranteed promise from God, you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can gain an overflow of confident hope, and I can gain that overflow of confident hope only because I put my hope, I put my trust in God who just happens to be the very source of hope. So we see the law of redemption already at work here, that God, the source of hope, is giving you some form of hope. Everybody's been given some faith, hope, and love, the three that remain. So he's given you some source of hope, and when you take that hope and invest it back into him, get ready for the overflow, because now you're gonna overflow not just with hope, but a better, stronger hope. You're gonna overflow with a confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see it at work? It's amazing. And then look at this. Romans 15, 4. The scriptures, the word of God. That's what gives us hope. So God is the source and Jesus is the delivery mechanism. Because the scripture is the word of God and the word of God is Jesus. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John 1, 14, and the Word became manifest in the flesh, and his name is Jesus. So God is the source, Jesus is the deliverer of the source, who gives us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Isn't that so good? Here's the guaranteed fact. God's promises will be fulfilled when we wait patiently so that we are encouraged in the word of God that it is yes and amen. That heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, it will remain. 
The world has tried to abolish the Bible off the planet for centuries and millennia, and they've never succeeded. It will never, ever be eradicated because it is faithful, it is true, and it is God in writing to us. So when you are in need of hope, you take the little bit of hope that you received and you reinvest that hope back into the source and you get more hope through the source's son, Jesus, through the word of God. I'm gonna make it very practical for you. We're going somewhere with this in January. Uh, when I was taking my time to pray into 2022 in November, I got a very specific word that I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag yet, but I'm just going to tease you a little bit with. But I got a very specific word of what God is going to be doing in our house and our family in 2022, and it's unbelievable and has a whole lot to do with this. The scripture gives us hope. So instead of running to the media, running to the news, running to our friend, running to, you know, TikTok to get some hope, we run to the word of God. And I'll tell you in a very practical way, when I was walking through the biggest crisis I've ever faced in my life three years ago, I felt like almost all hope was lost. And I got into this place where on the outside, I had a good poker face. But on the inside, I was not okay. And I was wondering and doubting my call. And I believe in some very firm principles in the word of God. I live my life by them. And one of them is this, that when you receive a word of God, you stay faithful to that word until he speaks again to send you in a different direction. And the last time I had checked, God sent me here to a city I'd never been in, a state I'd never been in, to do something that I've never done. So I should remain faithful to that, but here was the problem. I didn't feel like it. I started to count the cost and realize this is costing a lot. I've lost so much. I, I'm hurting so bad. And so I went to the source. But I didn't go to God as just the reverend, amazing, unbelievable creator of the heavens and the earth, I went to my father, who I have a relationship with. It's the first pillar of our vision statement here, know God. Know God, not just know of him. See, if I just knew of him, this wouldn't have worked. I just would have had to, to, to suck it up, buttercup, and stay faithful, shut my mouth, do my job. But I probably wouldn't be here today if I took that route. So instead, I went to my father and I just said, I know I should remain faithful to this word, but daddy, I just need to hear you say it again. I just need to know that your hand is still on me, that you still want me doing this. I was just hoping somewhere in there, he'd be like, no, you're good, bro. And I went on a 21 day of prayer and fasting, and on day 17, I could tell you what I was walking around with felt like a thousand pounds of darkness. I felt like I was fighting darkness every second of the day. But all I needed was one word. And on that 17th day of that 21 days of prayer and fasting, I was in prayer, wasn't expecting it, wasn't even looking forward to that moment. And he spoke. And he spoke to me the end of Psalm 23. And he made it very personal. He said, as for you, my son, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And you will dwell in my house forever. I have called you to this. I still remain with that call. Now get up and keep moving forward. And it was like instant. Do you see that? Come on, somebody. That is our snow machines for Christmas Eve. That's bubbles. That's fake snow. <laughs> so random. I feel like an angel. 
<laughs> I pray to the Lord every time I preach, Lord, just bring spontaneous joy. Sometimes the delivery isn't in what I expected, but man, we got it. Thank you. So all of that said, when God spoke that word to me, instantaneously, hope flooded every fiber of my being. And it wasn't just some ordinary, I hope it's going to turn out. It was this confident hope that we've been speaking of. And I knew that I knew that I knew that I am exactly where God has called me to be, doing exactly what God is wanting me to do. And that's all I needed to know. And all of that darkness and all that weight was lifted in a second. Are you hearing me now? The scripture gives us hope. We're coming into a new year. It is incredibly important. This is how often we think. We get to towards the end of a year and we start to look back. Don't do that. It's not good. You start to look back and you're like, yeah, I made these commitments. I really haven't lived up to them. I was really hoping I'd be here. And I'm like, Don't do that. Because often we have this idea that once the new year hits, something magical is going to happen because the date changes. And all of a sudden, everything's going to get so much better. But there's another principle. How you leave is how you enter. If I leave this room filled up with the Holy Ghost and encouraged and hopeful, I will enter that lobby the same way. And I will enter that parking lot, my car, my home, my family. They'll all experience what I left with. So if we try to leave 2021 as, ugh, I'm just glad this year's over, can't wait. No, 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 let's end this year strong. Let's end it right. Let's end it like we want the new year to begin. Because that threshold of the door is not magical and neither is a date change. It's really a principle that we have to take in of what perception are we gonna carry with us from the end of this year into the new year. And that is this, yeah, woulda, coulda, shoulda, but didn't, so what? Here's what I am set out to do. This is what I'm believing for. This is what I'm declaring over my life and over my family. This is what I am standing in faith for because my hope is filled with confidence from the Holy Spirit. Are you all with me? So that's the source. Now, look at number two, hope's reward. Hope has a reward attached to it. Psalm 147 verse 11, the Lord rewards those who fear him. Now that word fear is not like an abuse of father fear. That word fear, the best English word we really have for it is reverence. And the word reverence means to have deep respect, to be in awe, or to be in wonder of. So put it like that. The Lord rewards those who are in awe of him, who respect him, who, who reverence him. Those who put their hope in his mercy. Now we start seeing something happening of the law of redemption. Now we're starting to put our hope back in him. He's the one that gave it to us, and now we're putting it back in him. Look at this now. Proverbs 23, 18 in the old classic CGV. If y'all don't know what that is, it's the Chris Gilkey version. Because this one says, don't envy sinners and always continue in the fear of the Lord. And here's what those words translate out to mean in our modern day English. Don't envy those who are far away from God. Don't be looking at those far away from God and wishing and hoping that you had what they had. You don't want what they got. You don't. And you don't want to do what they had to do to get it. But always continue to be in wonder of the Lord. And look at this now. You will be rewarded for this. Your hope will have a future and it will not be cut off. This becomes incredibly important last week. If you missed it, check it out on, on the app. But Johannes brought out the original meaning of the Hebrew word for hope, and it means to tie yourself to the promises of God. And the scripture tells us that hope is an anchor to our soul. 
We don't want the rope holding the anchor to the boat that is our life to be cut off. So we don't want to be cut off from the promises of God. We don't want to be cut off from the, the steadiness and the rock steady belief that God is going to bring things around in our life. We don't want that to be cut off because we want to make sure that we have the future he's promised us and that our hope is on solid ground. So he's teaching us that hope has a reward that comes to it. And now we come full circle with it. So God is the source of hope. He's given that hope to us in some form. All of us have been given hope. And now what we do with it determines what the rest of our life is going to look like and what every circumstance and situation around us is going to look like by what we do with that hope. And that's what we have to make sure we do is number three is hope's redemption. We reinvest that hope back into the original investor himself. The, or, the origin of hope is God. The source is God. So God gives us his hope. And look at this, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Those who put their hope in the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That's the promise of God. This is the redemption factor. When you receive hope, and we all have, and we choose instead of letting that hope be stolen from us or letting that hope be put in something else other than the source, but when we take that hope and invest it back in to the one who invested into us to begin with, then all of a sudden a redemption factor starts to kick in to our lives and he redeems the hope that we once thought could be lost or was fleeting and that hope fills us with four promises of God that you will be renewed. Your strength will be renewed. You will soar, baby. You ain't just gonna snail by anymore. You're gonna be flying high above the clouds. More snow, yes. The booth is freaking out trying to figure out how to stop the snow, but I think the timing of it is awesome. Making me wanna preach. Some of them preach the house down, I preach the snow down. I'm about to bust out some ice ice baby. Some of y'all don't even know that vanilla ice stuff. Problem is I can't dance or sing. But I can preach. Those who put their hope in the Lord. I, I hope you're grabbing hold of this. God has given you something that is precious. And that precious thing is the gift of hope. And if you will take that hope, and instead of just trying to put it on something that can never help you, if you will just put that hope back into the Lord himself, those who put their hope in the Lord, then these four promises are guaranteed to happen in your life, that your strength will be renewed, that you will soar above all the mess, you will have a high-flying experience in this life and that you will finish your race because you will run and not grow weary and you will walk and you won't grow faint. That's the promises of God. And that's what we have to make our investment into. We take our hope and we reinvest it into the source and in turn, he redeems our life and breaks out four promises, four rewards that can't even compare to anything that we've ever experienced because they are so vast and so bigger and so more amazing than what we could achieve without God. And that's where I want this to land today. It's okay to not be okay. Hear this now. It is okay to not be okay. What's not okay is to remain not okay. Everyone is going through something. I'm walking my family, I'm walking my kids right now through their greatest crisis that they've ever faced. And it's a big one. Pray for me as I do that. Pray for my family as we pray for you. We're all going through something. But as we go through this, it really is going to be determined by our reaction. Are we going to look at the circumstances and freak out? Are we going to become not okay and then remain not okay? 
Or are we going to take that not okay moment to realize that's my wake-up call, that I have to take what he has invested in me, and I've got to run to the Lord. I've got to get in his word. I've got to declare his word over my life and over my family and over this city. I've got to stand in faith and believe that the best days are yet to come. That if God is for me, and he is, God is for you. He is not against you. And if God is for you, then who, who, who can stand against you? No one can. That means no demon can stand against you. No devil can stand against you. No neighbor, no coworker, no ex, no schoolmate. Nobody can stand against you when you are in God because God is for you. He is renewing you. He is soaring you to the highest heights. He is running with you, walking every step with you. That's the promises of God. And that, my friends, is the law of redemption. That which the enemy has stolen from you, God will catch him and make him pay back seven times over. So let's go to the source. Hey, Daddy, he stole from me. I need your help. I need your word. Get in that word. Declare that word over your life. Amen. Can we give Jesus one big thank you for his word today?